So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this panel that will look at the risk assessments for the safety of overflight of conflict zones. The panelists today are Captain Samir Sajet, who's the UN World Food Programme Regional Aviation Safety Officer, and Captain Martin Chalk, who's Deputy President of IFALPA, and myself as moderator, Rob Hunter, Head of Flight Safety at the British Airline Pilots Association. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately today, we don't have Dr. Hamdi Chaluk. Uh, he's had to give his apologies. So the shooting down of MH17 threw into stark relief the variable output of operators and nation states' risk assessments. Some airlines were flying through the eastern Ukraine and others were not. And shortly after the shooting down, uh, journalists from Holland contacted Balpa and they were running a story at that time about the concept of equality of information. So just like uh, citizens have rights about um, race and gender and so on, they felt that the, that the amount of information that was provided to citizens and to uh, uh, passengers taking, taking airplane flights should be equal. So whilst as safety professionals we can, we can understand that the outcome of a risk assessment is a very individual thing because it's an individual assessment, it's very difficult to explain that to the grieving relatives. So in this panel today, we'll explore some of these issues. And perhaps if we could start with Samir, if you could start by explaining some of the safety and security issues that are in your operations in, in flights into conflict zones. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, first, uh, thank you very much for uh, Dubai uh, Department Civil Aviation Authority for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the uh, humanitarian operations. Actually, maybe some of you doesn't know that uh, we are exist. However, uh, just for your information, uh, we have uh, a fleet of more than 100 aircraft representing World Food Program, uh, operating in uh, Africa, mostly in Africa and Asia. However, we have also more than 300 aircraft uh, for our sister organization, which is the Department of Peacekeeping, and uh, also uh, operates in, in Africa and uh, Asia and uh, South America. We respond in uh, uh, natural disasters and uh, man-made uh, disasters. Uh, actually, uh, we are uh, transporting, uh, transporting uh, passengers and uh, cargo uh, relief uh, operations. And mostly we are, we are uh, working in hostile area, difficult area, remote areas, and uh, we have Civil of, uh, several of uh, challenges in terms of uh, security, like uh, armed conflict, ter uh, terrorist uh, attacks, and uh, so on. So security is a, is a high uh, priority for us, and uh, you know we exposed to hijacking, bombing, and uh, attack against uh, crew and. Uh, uh, also aircraft. Um, I can list, uh, you know, I have, uh, you know, a lot of accidents happen with, the, with our aircraft and uh, crew, and uh, which, uh, uh, you know, in Darfur we have uh, three helicopter pilots are kidnapped, and uh, also uh, next, the year after, in 2011, we have uh, three also Bulgarian crew also uh, kidnapped. Uh, we have in 2013 hijacked. We have in Afghanistan aircraft uh, shut down. We have uh, crew attack. Uh, we have pilots killed. We, it's, the list is very long. Uh, I, I don't want to. Uh, but this is type of uh, you know, uh, operations that we operate in uh, uh, humanitarian operation. And this is uh, only because we need to be there, and we have to be there because there are lives we, we need to uh, uh, save. Uh, all these, you know, attacks and, uh, you know, it is, there's something behind it. It's, uh, it's the poverty, it's the uh, uh, 
maybe uh, uh, religion, maybe uh, it's uh, uh, politic things. And uh, however, you know, we are not uh, that heroes, you know, to go in such places without, uh, you know, prepared for this. So we do uh, an assessment together with the United Nations Department of uh, Safety uh, and Security uh, to go there to to to, uh, to operate uh, and also uh, with uh, safety uh, and security officers uh, in the ground in, in those countries and discuss uh, the situation with the uh, uh, country to find the best way uh, to operate. Um, also, uh, together, you know, we, we sit with operators, uh, regulators, uh, international organization to set up, you know, uh, ways, uh, you know, and defenses to uh, upgrade the risk from, uh, you know, to safety from unacceptable to tolerable. I will not say acceptable, I will say tolerable in order to uh, operate in, in, in such uh, operation. And also we share this information with, uh, with of course, with other, uh, uh, you know, uh, service providers in, in the same area. Uh, I was listening to the, the, to, to the panel, uh, you know, uh, previous panel, and they were talking about satellite tracking system and flight following. I want to tell you that in, in, you know, since 2003, we are using as a mandatory a flight following. Every single aircraft, we have 500 aircraft, has to be tracked, monitored. Even it's on the ground, you know, you, you, should, you, you know, see it on the screen that the aircraft is on the ground. It's a mandatory satellite track system now. Before we, we use, uh, you know, uh, radio system, uh, every 20 minutes there is a call from a crew to the uh, radio room. Each operation has a radio room. This is for domestic or international flight. So satellite tracking system is a mandatory equipment. Now, of course, the technology now is different than before. Before we use a radio, HF radio, now we are using satellite tracking system. Myself, as an, uh, a safety officer and auditor, I go to, uh, to the field and I, you know, ask the operator, if the operator from Europe, I call the headquarter operation room, where is your aircraft? And he has to inform me where is his aircraft exactly. Uh, security is a, a, a team effort, so let's all pull in the same direction. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So it seems that the basic elements are about information gathering, getting as much information as you can, and you described how you consult locally. And then there's a communications exercise and keeping communications going. Yeah. Are pilots involved in this communications exercise, in, for example, in the risk assessment itself or in that, in that committee that will make that assessment? Yeah, you know, for, for pilots, you know, uh, pilots, before they, f they fly, they have to be briefed. Mm -hmm. about the uh, security situation. And every single pilot fly for a humanitarian operation has to brief, uh, sorry, have to train on basic and advanced uh, security in the field. We have a special program. All pilots should go uh, uh, to this training, basic and uh, advanced. It's a uh, uh, very uh, good uh, security software that, you know, every single crew has to, to go uh, through. And also uh, a briefing he should receive uh, by the security officer, aviation security officer, before, before launching any flight. Okay, yeah. so Samir, it seems that in your operation it's a kind of bespoke arrangement, whereas in Martin's flying, where in the, in the commercial environment, I can see how there will be pressures for operators maybe not to share risk assessments uh, uh, with the pilots. What, do, you, do you think that's a, a possibility, Martin, and what, what would be the risks of that? It's not just a, a possibility, but it, 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 it happens that some operators don't share the, their basic thinking um, with their, their everyday crew. And there's the, 
the obvious risk in that, that if the crew don't understand the conclusions that the uh, operator ha has reached, that they may then undo all of the good work that's been done behind the scenes with uh, hard-won intelligence, with uh, um, good decision-making. Um, the the, the cl classic reason being if you see a, a bend in your flight plan and you feel you can uh, save your employer some money and time and the passenger's time by straightening out that dog leg, then uh, why wouldn't you do it? You, you would, unless you realize there was a good reason for that dog leg. Um, and the, 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 that's the simple one of saving a bit of money and time, but there, there could be a, a whole range of other reasons. Um, weather being in the way, uh, the ability to reach your airport with uh, sufficient fuel intact if you've been held low, partly because if people are all flying around the same piece of airspace, then uh, congestion increases, uh, and not every airplane can then re achieve their desired altitude. So there are lots of reasons why a, a pilot on the day may undo the good work that's been done behind the scenes in a risk assessment, and so it is imperative that, at the very least, as Samir says, they are briefed as to why the decisions have uh, been arrived at uh, prior to their flight. Yes. And you know, in our um, internal discussions at uh, BALPA, we, we, f we reflected on this situation that actually there's a heap of legislation that relates to commander's responsibility. So a commander is entitled to refuse to take a flight or to ask for the information to satisfy him or her, herself that the uh, operation is safe. Mostly, the commanders don't have to do that because that's all taken care of, uh, and there's trust that the operator is doing that. But I guess the, the shooting down of MH17 threw that into, into some sort of question. We're just going back to this, uh, this Dutch journalist and the questions that he had for us about equality of information. What sort of issues do you see about uh, the sharing of information between national authorities uh, so that we get maybe a, a, a uniform risk assessment made by different states? I think, as you alluded to at the beginning, mm. uh, a uniform risk assessment is, is too simplistic a view. Every uh, assessment will fall within a range of outcomes, and that will depend on the variety of data at the input stage, wh what access to data there is, and that's why I think it's Im imperative that uh, the Annex 17 requirement to share, for states to share the intelligence they do have is, uh, is something that we ought to be ha perhaps be a little more pedantic about and, and be more demanding of states to share their information. Um, but equally, once that information is shared between the states and then with their operators, clearly some operators will come to different conclusions. We know with our looking backwards at MH17 that immediately prior to and after that event, even airlines from the same country were arriving at different risk assessments and some were overflying and some were not. And so it is imperative that we find a way to share as much as we can. And states should be encouraged not to sit behind national security unless absolutely necessary. And air airlines should be encouraged to share the outcome of their decision making, even if they don't share the reasons for it. Um, I flew in yesterday with uh, our hosts today, Emirates, and I know exactly the route they take, they took from London to here, despite the fact between London and here there are one or two spots of heat on the map, uh, because they very kindly told me on their in-flight entertainment program, uh, they drew the map very clearly. So it is already uh, public knowledge once a decision has been made, and the advantage of collating that public knowledge is that Questions can then be asked by other airlines. Why is it that uh, Emirates, for example, may take one route and Etihad another? Is there something that one airline knows that the other as, at this moment does not? And should that information be shared and might that mean a different decision? Uh, so sharing information is uh, imperative and I think 
one of the ways we can do that without impinging on national security questions is to share the outcome of the decision making. Yes. So the question I'd ask to both of you, um, do you think it's feasible to have a body that would uh, uh, oversee this uh, risk assessment that would provide a, a unified standard for the world or do you think it has to be as it now is that it's uh, a, an individual risk assessment with best sharing as, uh, as, you, as you've both described? Yeah, actually, you know, uh, you know risk assessment is, is very, uh, very important and we have to do it jointly, you know. Avoid, you know, work uh, individual, okay? You will, you know, teamwork uh, is, is, is the, uh, you know, uh, is very benefit for, for everybody. Actually, what we did, for example, in, uh, in Somalia, if you fly from Kenya to Somalia, uh, according to Jibison, you are flying in danger zone. Uh, however, you know, we did the risk assessment with uh, IKO, with the FAA, with U.S. Army, with U.S. Air Force, with the local authority, and with the, you know, uh, a company is a specialist in mapping. And we draw, we, we establish new routes now. You know, flying from, from Kenya to Somalia is different than the one in, in, in Jefferson. It's more safe, more practical, and this is, the, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the model we will have it now in, in, for South Sudan, we will have it in, in Sudan, and we, we will have it in, in different places. So uh, risk assessment, uh, you know, safety assurance, when we put some defenses, some controls, we need to know if this is practical, this is good, it's uh, efficient, sufficient, uh, you know, and then we can, you know, uh, have the benefit of, of our flights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Rob, ri risk assessment, risk analysis, it's not a simple matter. It's a, a complex area. And um, in interestingly, I, I noticed a number of people this morning already <clears throat> have made statements that you would argue from a risk uh, perspective were incorrect. Uh, and, and that's amongst a, a group of experts. So it's not a simple matter, and the more data we collect, the better the risk analysis is likely to be. Um, the best decisions are generally made when you have all relevant data, or as much relevant data as you can collect. Um, so it's also imperative that confidence in a risk analysis is high. So, particularly amongst those who have to carry out the uh, decisions that are, uh, arise from it. So, involving them in that decision making is the best way forward. Um, you can learn useful information from those that have to deliver the final product. And so, involving the pilots in the risk assessment both helps them to, to adhere to it, it helps them have confidence in it, but also there's um, information they can feed back that would help the risk assessor come to the correct decision. It's, it's not a simple matter of uh, balancing the commercial cost of taking uh, a long route versus the increased risk uh, of not uh, overflying. It, that, that is a very complex decision and it is the, the best analysis comes when all of the data or as much of the data as possible is shared. Yes, that's interesting, and I'm reminded of the sort of greater detail of the point that, that you're making now, uh, because we uh, discussed this earlier. And you were saying that really we, we talk about these risk assessments as though they're just in one part, assessing the risk. That's difficult enough, you know, what, how you assess that risk, very difficult thing to do. But after you've assessed the risk is the next part of deciding what your level of risk is for the flight you want to do and how commercial pressures might um, alter that. So it's a sort of two-part thing. I thought that was very interesting. The, 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 if you like, the ob objective risk assessment as best as you can, and then the separate assessment afterwards of, do we want to take that risk? Do we need to take that risk? Do we have to take that risk? Well, we, we take risks 
all the time. Um, an interesting uh, example that's not in aviation um, that came up in, uh, in my country a little while ago. I live in the UK, and there was a very bad railway accident. Railways, like aviation, are a relatively safe occupation taking a train. But because there was a railway accident, the uh, assessment following that was that almost twice the number of people died in that railway accident as were on the train that crashed because a significant number of people would then have made the failed risk analysis of not taking a train but driving. And driving is so significantly more risky, at least in my country, than taking the train that that would have cost another set of lives on top of the ones that died in the train. And so it's not a matter of deciding whether there is a risk in what you're doing. It's balancing the risk between making the decision one way and making the decision the other way. And I think Samir is, is in an uh, almost unique position in suggesting that in his case, deciding not to operate, that may well save in inverted commas, save the lives of the crew or the aeroplane, but may cost many other lives in not undertaking the role that the UN undertakes. So there is a, a very challenging risk analysis undertaken in the, in the UN context. In the commercial context, it tends to be a, a more uh, financially based decision, but it's, it's neither is simple and or both benefit from more and better information and more shared information, shared between the regulators, the operators who carry the uh, actual financial burdens, and the pilots who carry the very real decisions on the day, the, the, the pilot in command. Okay. Gosh, so I'm conscious that uh, we have an audience that's expecting us to come up with the uh, solution, perhaps, of uh, <laughs> how do you uh, do the, the risk assessment for the safety of overflight. And I think that where we've got to is uh, we can't see that there can be a single body do it, making all those decisions uh, at this time. So it is down to the arrangements that we have uh, at the moment for individual risk assessments. And picking up on the points you've made, it seems that it's about good communications and, and sharing information. It seems that it's about pilot training. It seems that it's about local knowledge. It seems that it's about co comms, satcoms, and so on once you're out in the field. Um, so I guess what we're, what I'm trying to summarize now is you have to do your best, and what does doing your best look like? Yeah. And we have these points. Are there any other points, um, gentlemen, that in terms of what does doing your best look like in this? Yeah, actu actually, uh, uh, you know because of the age, so I have to put some notes here. <laughs> so uh, we have to consult the authorities. You know, if you are flying into a, a destination, we need to, to consult the authorities and, you know, to identify the danger zones. Uh, this is one of the, of the things. Uh, a very good risk assessment that we have to do according to the NX19 safety management system and the uh, state safety program uh, of the country. Uh, sharing of in information is very, very uh, important. And I think, uh, uh, you know, after the, the Malaysian uh, uh, accident, uh, you know, uh, the task force from uh, IKO uh, emphasized on uh, sharing of uh, information, uh, you know, with the airport, with the authorities, with the uh, uh, you know, international organization, we have to share joint efforts, as, as we said, teamwork, uh, established system for timely exchange information, uh, such as uh, NOTAMS. Uh, NOTAMS is very, very important, you know, for uh, a crew to, uh, you know, uh, have the information about a uh, complex zone, dangerous area, and, uh, and we have to update it. Uh, flight following. Uh, I think flight following satellite tracking system is very important. This is very good for search and rescue issue. When our aircrafts uh, or helicopter shut down, 
uh, we, we notified immediately and we kn knew where is the aircraft, uh, you know, uh, crashed. So that helps us, you know, to save lives of the crew or passengers. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the insurance companies, insurance companies, uh, you know, require additional costs uh, for war zone uh, policy. And I think insurance companies should play a good role in, in uh, you know, helping and find uh, ways and, you know, uh, especially in the risk assessment. Yes, thank you. Do you have anything to add, Martin? No, I think okay. what everything you said. So, look, that's been very helpful because it seems to me that an important output of this panel is a list of things to do. We've been through uh, quite a few items on that list. And I guess now I'd like to ask uh, the audience, what does doing our best look like? What, what do you think additionally should be on that list? And we'll take other questions too, but just on this point about the list of things you can do to, 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 to be best at this kind of risk assessment. So. My name is Joachim Witz, Qatar Civil Aviation. Thanks a lot for that uh, good panel. And um, I can say we deal on daily basis with this kind of risk assessment. Two statements, one as a pilot, as an ex-pilot flying in conflict zones in the 90s, uh, even for UN. <laughs> we wrote every day, every day a report. So that gives us a possibility to have the information in the area. And then the director of operation could take decisions to go somewhere. That was a common practice. And then we had some, let's say, we call it hot mail intelligence service in the area. So some people giving us very solid information. Now, as a regulator, I can say we have to have really a system in place. So risk management is all about data. And the system in place means initially the operator has a full responsibility to decide to fly over Iraq or not. But the regulator cannot step out. The regulator uh, is obliged to have a track on it because you mentioned it, Annex 19, we have to audit the quality and safety system, uh, management system. So we have to have a picture how he is doing his risk management. So we have to be involved. So the system must be in place, and the system must be a closed-loop system. So right, we use also intelligence service, we use uh, um, other authorities, and there is an, another conflict. Of course, everybody would like to have an overflight because of the money. Yeah? And then the risk is, let's say, calculated low, but it's not low. So we need all this data, and uh, we have a system in place Telling our, let's say, major carrier on, let's say, I can say minute basis, how the risk looks like, for example, over Iraq. We have a tracking system in place, approved, so that if there is some, let's say, something coming up while the aircraft is in the air, the tracker goes to a coordinator and even the route will be changed just in the air. And that is a system what we need a closed loop system, not only the information, and then we have to deal with the time, and as a regulator, you have to, I think, to oversight, to do oversight, and have a picture, because if something happened, it's not only the operator sitting there having a press conference, it's also the regulator sitting there. So okay. you have, to, you have, to, you have to, to come together. The problem is sharing data is a little bit difficult, because the risk evalu evaluation is made by, let's say, experts, a team, and if you share then that data with, let's say, another authority or another airline, um, the point of view can be totally different. Uh, that is a little bit uh, a, a tricky thing. Thank you. Okay. But you know, maybe there's another aspect in which the, uh, the data is unusual. If we think about um, other safety-related data, let's say uh, uh, an engine issue, you know, some sort of st structural issue with an aircraft, uh, sharing the issue, t telling everyone about it, 
doesn't increase the risk. It's sort of the communication of it is, is safety neutral, but I guess it can be the case that if you share your security assessments, it can actually cause you security problems in itself. And is that maybe a special reason why the regulator should be involved, or how do we, how do we square that one? No, it, it's very simple. Uh, as a regulator, you grant an AOC. So you approve, you, you, you approve a company to work. So simply, you go to the quality system, to the safety management system. So you have to know how they tackle the risks for the operation. Huh? And, and, and therefore, you have to be in the loop and you have to do oversight, gaining your own data out of your own oversight and, uh, and having a picture how the operator is doing his oversight, yes. his own audits and getting his data. And then you have the system in place. I'm not, talk, I, I'm not talking about, let's say, um, data out of the DFDR, out of the uh, uh, engine monitoring, whatever. That should be shared. That is not no discussion about that. The problem is if you fly over conflict zones, you set up a team, you have your connections on place, you have to have a closed loop system and you have to be involved. If you share that data, let's say via the internet or other means with another operator flying over the same area, uh, it could be, let's say, tackled in a totally different way because yes. they, have not the, they have not the full picture. Yes. And then, of course, we have to talk about uh, competition. Yes. Yeah? So if, if you fly over Iran to Europe, you, you, uh, you, you spend around $200,000 more than, ex than if you take a shorter route uh, somewhere over Iraq. Yeah. And you have to have a picture. Do they have uh, missiles going up to 40,000 feet or not? Uh, you have to engage intelligence service. A big threat is a man pad thing if you land in Kuikuk or Baghdad, whatever. So, uh, but the people has to be supported. Of course, we, our airline uh, had flights to that place, but we canceled just on the spot in the minute last week because we got the information and the data. So it's a, it's a flexible taking and given, and you have to track it all the time. It's not enough to have a system in place and then, of course, the system uh, is there, and then you tackle it every two days or something like that. You have to do it with light monitoring on the minute, on the spot. And that is a big difficulty on that. Very good. I think your comments have been very helpful. Thank you. Do we have any other comments on the, about this list of what the, the right thing to do is, what, what good looks like? There's a hand in the middle at the back. The gentleman at the back. Or at least an, an anonymous hand, that's all I can see. Um, James Turkola again. Uh, obviously, different perspectives have been discussed. I just want to go back to the idea of internal communication. Uh, let me get this right. If I understood correctly, uh, the actual uh, situation in many uh, commercial organizations, that the commander of the flight is not necessarily uh, shared uh, information about the risk assessments carried out. Uh, is that right? That's is right. That, okay. That, that I, I'm varies. Okay. I'm gobsmacked about it because, <laughs> I mean, the first question, I guess, it's, it's not shared with the commander of the flight, but somehow director of flight ops, VP flight ops, must have been involved in the risk assessment process. And secondly, do you think it's also uh, that risk assessment has also escalated to the, particularly uh, the topic itself, uh, flying over conflict zones, it's es also escalated to the CEO, CEO level or the chairman of the SRB level. Uh, that's the first question, I guess. And secondly, uh, the, from corporate governance point of view and also from even uh, health and safety point of view, uh, the organization of a duty of care to the uh, to not only the passengers but also to the employees and uh, I'm absolutely gobsmacked that sort of this information uh, however limited it can be uh, is, is not actually uh, shared with the uh, people who are exposed to the risk in the first place 
And if I may just say, the, the ICAOs and the current legislation around the world from SMS point of view is not so explicit about the risk communication. But when you actually look at the ISO 31000, it's, it's quite explicitly is another one of the fundamental components of risk management. And uh, although I'm always skeptical about introducing new legislation, but maybe there is a room to actually go back and revisit the existing SMS legislation and actually put more emphasis on uh, risk communication aspects. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think you're, you make a good point. Um, the challenge is always the level to which adherence to ideals are met. So um, I, I very much echo the comments uh, from the front of the, the room here that this should be a closed loop, that there should be a discussion that takes place uh, amongst the, the, the three main stakeholders plus all of the others that uh, are involved, but that the government, the operator, and then the, as you say, the person who has to deliver the product of the decision, those three need to be in the loop in order that the information is of the highest quality, therefore the decision making is of the highest quality, and crucially that the decision making is enacted. Because without the decisions being enacted, you end up with uh, very good decisions that are then ignored. Uh, and, and that is a, a, a big problem. W one of the things I think that dogs this issue, that, that is a, a handicap in this issue, is assumption. There's lots of assumptions made that if a rule is written or if a, a requirement is laid, that it will therefore be followed. And there's an assumption that when a flight plan is filed, it will be followed. Let me tell you, no flight plan or very, very few flight plans are followed to the letter. They are tactically changed on the day for a whole variety of reasons. And uh, the responsibility for that lies generally between the air traffic controller and the uh, pilot in command. So assumptions are things that we need to drive out of the system when it comes to something as difficult, as complex, as sophisticated, as a risk an analysis of overflight of a conflict zone. Um, and the way to drive assumptions out of the system is to have all the parties talking as often as is practical in order to make the decisions and the enactment of those decisions as uh, ruthlessly sensible as possible. Yes, thank you. They're never going to be perfect. Okay, very good. So we have just a minute of our slot time remaining now. So if there are, any, are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, oh, anything you like. I just want to add uh, something. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, for uh, close uh, loops and, uh, you know, uh, we are doing this uh, on uh, humanitarian operations and uh, usually we, uh, you know, we meet all the stakeholders, regulator, operators, IKO, and uh, next month in, in Nairobi we have a, a safety campaign for East Africa where all operators, IKO, FAA, and, uh, you know, uh, working together, you know, to find ways how we can fly safe in East Africa. And after that, we will have uh, the same model in Dakar, we will have in Congo, we will have in Chad, in Sudan, and also in uh, South Africa. Thank you. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry if there are those of you who haven't been able to ask us a question. We're um, uh, sitting on a table just at the front here, and we can catch up with you at the... Uh, the coffee break for that but we're out of time now so thank you very much for your attention and thank you to the panelists thank, thank you, you.